Welcome everyone to the Occult Sciences. I'm Grandmaster Dr. Thor Templar, and as usual, I'm your guide through this amazing, fascinating, and exciting world. And what I'm going to cover today is, which is uh, very important for anyone involved in the occultism, to be very aware of, and that is occult disease. Oh yes, there's a serious problem with this. As in life in general, um, the contagious factors of being around other people, and particularly other occult is and occult groups, is something you have to be very careful of. Because you, when you make contact with an occult organization or an occultist in general, um, as a basically nice person, you are completely open to the energies there because that's what occultism is all about. You contact someone, you're open, you're basically saying your inner magical being is contacting the inner magical being of that organization or that person, and you're communing. And of course, that's what it's all about. And being a person involved in occultism, um, you believe in it, you know it works. And you want it to work. Now, these are all the factors that what you've just done is you've dropped all your protective shields, and rightfully so. Um, but there are dangers with that, and you have to be careful who you communicate with. And this is something very few people take into consideration. They contact groups, they buy books, they do everything. And what happens is that since the entire occult process is something that is very potent, but very, very subtle, it's very difficult to know what's going on. And this is why so many people uh, uh, get turned off by the occult, don't think it works, etc. Because it's very difficult to trace results. Uh, positive or negative for that matter, because people rationalize and say, well, it didn't happen from this, it happened from that. Um, but if you're dealing in this world of energy, and that's what we're dealing with, all the physical boundaries are gone. What does that mean? And uh, it means that time and space has no uh, value, which is how magic works in general. You're instantly affecting somebody when you're doing rituals with them. So the energy is, goes from you and goes to whomever that is instantly. And you're transferring information. I mean, you can uh, equate a lot of this with, um, uh, or give examples that are similar, uh, with uh, computer technology that we all use. You know, when you connect to someone's site, you're there. And if there's crap on that site, including a virus or anything else, it's transferred to you. And these levels become more strong as uh, and affect you greater depending on what you do with that information. As we know, looking at a site or looking at information will have a certain effect on you and even your computer. And of course, occult-wise, looking and taking stuff in goes right into your consciousness. Um, it doesn't go in as strong because you haven't accepted it. But when you accept something like um, it would be equated with downloading a program, look out, baby, it's a coming. And if there's a nice little Trojan or something in that downloaded program, you is a screwed. And of course, your inner magical being um, is kind of like a, a protective software program, which will stop some attacks and other things. And um, But not entirely, because you are still open. You are not seeing it as attack. It's very sneaky. It's very Trojan itch in terms of the fact of is that you don't really know what's going on, but they're affecting you. Any serious organization is also uh, has spells on or energies connected to deliberately to their material. The guild does this. We deliberately connect all sorts of protective and uh, uh, energies uh, to affect the person. We, we want to, our material is all about connecting you to energies, not this is a book you bought at Walmart or uh, Amazon or whatever in terms of just getting a, a crude book where you walked into a store and pull it off the shelf. Obviously, we sell through Amazon, but uh, it's not like just getting a product is, is, is what I'm saying there. <laughs> um, our books are registered and activated to you personally. Our books also have other things for random people, and the fact is they can't use them. 
And if people try and copy them or are using pirated editions now, uh, they get a nice little curse placed on them. Uh, if you try and copy the books, you mess up the encodings that's in them and they create huge toxic energy fields. And this is to protect the information and protect those who should get it and those who shouldn't be messing with it. Well, we warned you. It's in the book as well. But it's not nice to steal from anybody and it certainly is very bad to steal from the guild. You won't regret it. So the bottom line is, is that while we do this very openly and uh, we have the skill to do it, this is done uh, by a lot of occult people and it's done even subconsciously. The fact is, is when you're writing about this subject matter, which is all about etheric effects and connecting to people and everything else, um, I'm just amazed at how occult books seem to just ignore this. And you talk to occultists, particularly all these boob, boobish buffoonish morons, otherwise known as occult authors. I'm an expert. I read a few books. I can write real well. I went to schoolie, and schoolie taught me I got age. The problem with these buffoonish idiots is that um, there's a serious problem there that they, when you contact these people, and he's not as a fellow occultist, they talk to you like this is your fixing cars. Yeah, well, you do this spell and that spell. What are they talking about? It's like this is just some sort of how-to information on anything, or a cookbook for that matter. You rarely see uh, occultists seem to communicate in occult terms. Well, this energy, that energy is going to affect them. It's very bizarre, and, and uh, the problem with most of these um, common authors that are published through the big publishers um, is that they all are a bunch of nothing more than uh, low-level researchers and have little to no energy or power whatsoever. I've still yet to meet a general author that had any power. Um, so it's one of those things, but... Putting that aside in terms of the bigger picture of their incompetency level, there's still this whole communication level going on. So you are dealing with things that you are transferring different types of energy constantly because that's the nature of the tool. So if uh, if you're going to um, a, um, a sex party, you're going to be having sex and you're going to be transferring fluids. You have to be careful just to use a bizarre example, but, you know, uh, all these things have greater impacts on people. So the point is, that's the nature of it. Regardless, if you go there and people talk about their job or the weather, what's happening there is that's the process there, and people ignore that in occultism for some reason. And, you know, you do that at your own great detriment. So it's very important when you start getting involved with an organization um, and get involved with people. And that even goes to a certain extent of who they are in terms of even reading their books. You know, even if you get a common book from Llewellyn or something else, what is connected to that? Who is that author? And, you know, it's a good idea if you're going to, um, to get a book on someone, particularly a common author, that you look up them on the Internet and see who are they. Is, is there any tracing of what they're involved in? And what you want to look at is what organizations are they involved with? What is their tradition of magic? Now, there's a whole qualification ex uh, component here, which everybody ignores as well, because almost no one has any proper training in anything that's an occultist. They're all writers, and they've written a lot of books, and they maybe they've been a, uh, gone to or were a member of some organization for very short periods of time, but generally they have no official background. It's one of the problems that there's no official training out there, except from the guild right now. There are a few little metaphysical colleges, not really occult-based, they're metaphysical-based. There are different occult organizations that have been around a long time, uh, to different degrees of whether they're real or not. Um, you know, there may be people, members of the Golden Dawn and so forth, but there isn't really any true members of the Golden Dawn because that organization closed over 100 years ago and uh, people just picked it up. There is the OTO and other organizations which have all sorts of problems and negativity connected to them because their association with, and you should know that if you become a member of an organization as best you can, 
but it's not something they hide in the OTO, um, that it was, it's all completely written about and connected to Aleister Crowley, who is one of the scum buckets of occultism, not to mention a complete and total failure. So what is their connections? A lot of times you can also get this from how a book is dedicated. Who are they dedicating the book to? I remember many years ago that um, uh, when I was uh, seeking out books on runes and so forth, um, that I got a book from Idrid Thorson, who a lot of people give credibility to for one reason or another. Um, and the books are basically okay, but there is an internal connection and stream of energy connected to his books, which are very, very negative. And why is that? You know, I went through the, uh, and at that particular time, which is about 20 years ago, I went through the introduction and uh, I said, and I read that in terms of who he dedicated to, and, and a couple of names kind of rang with me. I said, gee, I've heard of that pe person. I was listening to a particular uh, very late radio show out of Los Angeles on public radio. Uh, a guy, I think his name was Tuckman or whatever, I'm not sure, but... Um, and he was talking about particularly some very interesting things in occultism he used to cover in his late night type show. And he covered a lot about that time, which of course it was big, was Satanism. And he did some very inter interesting information. There's a lot of uh, fascinating information that came from him. And here I'm reading this introduction. It says he's dedicated his book partly to Michael Kino. I said, gee, that sounds familiar. Kino, who is that guy? Didn't I just hear about him on that radio show? And of course, in this day and age, it's very easy uh, to track people. How great the information is is something you have to be a little bit careful of, but generally the information on the web at least gives you a good pointer. You have to be careful with the amount of negativity that's on the web because people are jealous and hateful. But what have they been involved in? Now, here's a person who openly thanked the head of the Temple of Set in his crowning book to go out to the public, Idrid Thorson, Michael Aquino. So what is this? Well, I mean, it really tells you where this person's coming from. How can you be an Odinist and then follow the, as they would consider, an, uh, the Judaic uh, Christian god of Satan, or Set, as they like to, but they, you know, got to remember, Setanians are basically Satanists, they just changed their name because they didn't really want to support Anton LaVey and give them their money, they wanted to start their own, and of course, uh, Michael Aquino, being the huge egomaniac that he is, certainly didn't want to follow somebody else, particularly when he, something happened that he didn't like it. But that's a whole other story there. But the point is, this guy, in his introduction, is thanking the head of the Temple of the Set, which happens to be that he is the second in charge, running the Nazi wing of the Temple of Set, known as the Order of the Trapezoid. And it has been a, t a Temple of Set matter and uh, has extreme uh, leanings towards uh, and beliefs and loves for Nazism in his own little perverse way. Is there any other way? <laughs> but um, who has allegedly been said that he believes he's a reincarnation of Heimlich Himmler. Charming guy that was exterminated uh, 10 million of his own people and probably 20 million to 30 million other people that he was in charge of. Charming little runt who was the great hero who shot him, so, who took drugs, I should say, instead of fighting it out like the great tough warrior that he was. Um, who couldn't even build any muscles because he didn't have enough testosterone in him. And by the way, I believe that he didn't even, uh, there was a connection there of whether he even was dead by the time that uh, Thorson was, or whose real name is Edred Flowers, um, was connected to. So, all in all, uh, there it is. And in a lot of cases, they don't even hide because they, they know how ignorant you are. But, you know, you can look things up on the net now pretty easily and find connections. And, of course, he doesn't hide that any longer because we, the Guild exposed him many years ago. And it's pretty much common knowledge. And, of course, he wasn't trying too hard to hide when you pretty much dedicate your book to this to someone. 
I mean, it's not too complicated. Not to see that he wasn't exactly hiding. So, and uh, of course, he claims he's really good friends with the owner of Llewellyn and has even worked for Llewellyn, Carl Lewesky. Well, that's kind of interesting, too, isn't it? Think about that. So, the whole idea is that um, you really don't need to know who you're getting involved with because you are transferring and. With the guild system, of course, this is a big part of what we do. We actually deliberately transfer and connect you to our power stream so that it will empower you faster and quicker so that you can reach higher levels at the highest possible degree in the shortest period of time. But this happens regardless when you read other people's information. If you get a book from someone who's connected to and states that they are demons, that they work with demons, and they get, they're so great about it, and they have godlike powers. Outrageous as that is, you are connecting into their stream of really goofball lying consciousness, which will depower you and will transfer negative energies into you, and you will have problems in the occult. We have to be very, very careful. And if you are actually going to read someone else's material, you ought to do a little ritual to protect yourself from that material while you're reading it. You know, you've got to live a very occult lifestyle. Everything's energy, and if you just allow any energy to pour into you all the time, you will depower yourself and toxify yourself. You will become ill from occult. You will get the occult illness. And this goes with all sorts of problems with transferring or using other people's occult products, their books, even. And these are personal things. And, you know, we talk about the occult cleanliness aspect in all of our books in our introduction. And it's very true. If you use other people's study materials and everything else as an occultist, you're opening up to that. You are allowing yourself. That's the nature of the study. So... If you're in the lab business and you're handling blood samples, you're going to be handling blood and everything that goes with that. Now, there's very little difference between handling blood samples and handling occult energy samples from someone, except one is very physical and one is very energetic. But in lots of ways, the blood, of course, is physical, so you're more protected by it. It's easier. You wear gloves. You take a little precautions. When it comes to occultism, people are just wide open. I'm just going to read this bozo's book. And, and, uh, and one of the biggest problems that happens is you believe information that's in a book as well. And this is a type of occult illness. When you should look at it as basically, hmm, that's interesting information. You know, this is why I always say when I sign off anywhere is to uh, believe nothing and question everything. And of course, that is still goes for a guild information to a certain extent as well. You know, it has to work in your life, and if it doesn't work in your life, then it doesn't really have much validity to you. Now, we are a serious research and teaching organization, so, you know, we're a much more higher cut above than some author who's making money out of or some little Satanist uh, who's making money off of you and, and pushing their particular point of view and their energies, which when you use their systems or their books, you become touched by the wings of the locust, as is stated in cult circles. The evil locusts who eat everything in their way and come in swarms, devouring, destroying. You know, you need to be very aware of this. And you need to be very aware that you just can't grab anything occult or grab anybody's occult tools or use anybody's books. Their energy is imprinted in there. So if you use a friend's book, um, any book of theirs, they lend you a book, you're picking up their energy from that. They are pouring that into there. They've made connections, and you're connecting to that same stream of power and drawing it into you. So there are simple things you can do by just putting up basic little shields, lighting a candle of protection, um, oil on it, writing on there, you know, cleanse the energies from this book. You could... Technically, put a candle on top of it before you read it. You could even pour some salt on a book cover. Uh, obviously, you don't want to hurt your books, but you could you could even do that. 
put a little piece of wax paper down, pour the salt on top of it, these type of things to, uh, to actually cleanse the book. You know, people don't think about this. They don't understand this really serious problem of occult disease. And it's a very serious problem. So, you know, you need to be very aware. And, of course, that goes with training in general. I mean, just from an aspect of, um, of credibility of what you're learning from. And you're, you're spending money. Uh, you're getting even this uh, uh, possibility of occult disease. Um, you're connecting with energies. You're basing some of your life on this, if not a large part of your life. And who are they? I mean, you know, there isn't, you don't go down your main street and there's a bunch of uh, signs out that say, you know, Main Street College, um, you know, Side Street College. I mean, there isn't a bunch of colleges opening up teaching people. And a lot of that is not because of the fact that there isn't a great need or business for that. But, you know, there are regulations and so forth to make sure this teaching is up to a value and is accredited and is useful somewhere else. I mean, it's also why colleges are expensive and everything else. This is an institution which is known and proven to teach you at a certain level with a certain credibility. So you wouldn't go to the Main Street College over going to UCLA. Why would you do that? Because the Main Street College has nothing backing them up whatsoever. They're not accredited. And even if they were, why would you go to something that is unknown? But what is their background? Well, what do they have to offer? I'm an author. I've been a member of one organization. I only know what the Temple of Set told me. Well, that's not very good accreditation, period. And you, you, can't, and you can't judge a book by how particularly well it is written or structured. Generally, there's a certain value that comes out in all books that are published that someone will either pay for or assist, and you get a certain level of quality of writing there. So um, you know, a poorly written book is not a bad book, and a well-written book is not a good book. And generally, the, uh, the more these writers write and the larger the books they are in terms of page counts usually mean the crappier they are. But what is their training? Now, they put a bibliography in the back, which is basically a bunch of very common books you can find anywhere. Uh, some have went to some library, but it's very interesting of how hardly anybody researches any difficult text to find. If you can't find it for free somewhere, uh, they ain't got it in their bibliography. Because you cost them too much. Oh, they're very dedicated, aren't they? I'm going to teach you everything I know from all the free junk that I got. And that's not an exaggeration. Of course, now there are accesses to those serious researchers that can get some information online and can access. So these things have changed to a large degree. But you rarely see anybody accessing any rare books unless it's a book on that rare book and they somehow have a museum near them or somebody else has a collection in their library uh, for that particular museum or institution uh, where they were able to access that and go through it. Uh, but they certainly aren't uh, doing that. And uh, we've never had people even come to us to ask for research information or whatsoever. And why is that? There are such great researchers. Hmm, interesting. It just shows you how bad researchers they are. And of course, our books that sell for tens of thousands of dollars on the net certainly is nothing they ever will invest in anyway. So you have to be very careful uh, with all these things of who they are, how serious they are, what are they about. And basically all the occult publishers out there are all, and the authors that are there are very poor researchers uh, and um, very poor trainers in general in terms of teaching. They've written a book of whatever value you want to give to that and however well it is structured that it appears that they may know something when they really don't. And few people understand this because we're in a unique position because we've published books from a whole bunch of people. We've even made people successful that are very popular today because of what the Guild did for them. And the fact is that these people did absolutely nothing, the most ignorant loser buffoons that there ever were. 
And that information at the time was okay, but it was within a very much of a structure of the guild and was not meant to be used on its own. It was meant to be used as part of that information in which we guided those people and edited their books so that they would have information that was of quality, which they knew nothing about, most of them. Or they produced books that are the same old dribble that's been coming out for the last 50 years. So all of these are things to understand. But the point is, is that... Um, when you get into contacting energies, you're picking up the energies from these particular people. Even as he said, if you use a book, if you use a tool, if you get something from someone, an occultist, or you find something that uh, has particular um, energy from an occultist, you know, people like to get these. You know, you get a souvenir that um, uh, Elvis Presley wore. And of course, you feel like you know you you, you kind of got a part of Elvis. You got some of his energy there. And that, why is that? Because he wore this. His energy was in it, and that energy is being transferred to you to some extent. And this is true. If you get an antique or something old, or a ring from a particular era, or an old coin, that has the energy from that particular time and place, and even the person that owned it last. That's all part of occultism, and it's also part of regular energetic science. So just grabbing anything, and this includes information, or even reading things off the web, you have to be very careful that there isn't all sorts of things being transferred to you and that your entire aura doesn't get messed up. And it's a really serious problem. If you're going to go around and start getting uh, books about Satanism and demons, of course, which are very popular now, um, this is not a joke, people. You know, it's taken now as a joke because people think that the so-called White Lodge is so impotent and the Black Lodge is running things and uh, that, there, that there's somehow power in so sorts of demons when it really isn't true. And, that, you know, demons have always been suppressed by the positive people. And, you know, negativity rules because positivity sits on his ass and drinks beer and eats pizza. And even with the lazy, do-for-nothing, so-called good people, the Black Lodge is continually kicked in the butt and kicked out of everything, eventually. But if we go through history of all the tyrants and everything else, they've all been destroyed. Japan didn't win. Germany didn't win. None of the Middle Eastern psychotics have won. Now, whether they've been replaced by anybody much better, you know, you can always argue. But the point is, is that none of these people did. Stalin didn't win. So ultimately, where is the great... You know, they do things sneakily in the back and they lie to you and they smile at you from their church that they've infiltrated and taken over and abuse your children and you and take your money. They don't do it straightforward. And you allow that because, you know, after all, Bates the bear in the couch. What sports is on? So, you know, all of these things are very important, and of course, you know, when you start dealing with occultism, you have to be very careful. So, if you buy a used occult book somewhere, you should handle that like an occult tool, and you should cleanse it. And if you buy something, do a little research. Who is that person? Do you really want to have a book written on runes from a guy who's a Satanist, whose entire background is based in uh, the amusing racism is of, of it all is is that uh, basically it's a Middle Eastern uh, religion a setism uh, and this guy who is so against all that stuff with his Nazi leanings um, is embracing that and you have to go through all sorts of things in the Temple of Set and follow their systems it certainly isn't you know it's, it's quite amusing it's also quite amusing that uh, Edred Flowers his real name um who is not Germanic. Uh, that's maybe a British name, uh, but who studied Germanic occultism, has a degree in it, and spent time in Germany, apparently, and went to all these lodges, wherever connections he somehow got through that. But apparently, it's, it's alleged that he married a Jewish girl who actually was... Weisner, the publisher, Samuel Weisner, who's a famous occult publisher, who now is Red Wheel because he's 
retired and sold his business, of course, sold it to a conglomerate, is Jewish. And the only way the great, powerful Setians were able to get their books published was through a relative. A Jewish relative, by the way. Isn't that interesting? Um, a little sideline, but this is the kind of backstory nonsense going on from these basic uh, frauds out there who are perpetrating their will through their particular books. And by the way, everything E.J. Thorson's ever written has been copied from uh, German text, from what I can tell. Nothing new there, but none of these Satanists have anything new to develop anyway. They, they copy things. That's what they do. So, you know, you need to know this, who's connected to it, because it's not just the information. Is that information of any value? That's part of it. But it's the occult disease factor. So you're taking all this stuff in, and it's depowering you, and they're connecting their energy to you, and you start to go along with their understandings, and you start to become infected by their disease, and you start to be thinking the way they think. And of course, you know, you are intimately following their systems. I mean, when you're doing occult practices, it's like you're having sex with that energy. And there's this huge transfer of energy by doing that. And that's all very bad. So you need to know, and that's why you certainly don't want to use, you know, especially if you're getting very energetic products, whatever they may be, but occult products in particular uh, have this problem. And the guild products are all geared to this. All of our material is geared towards the individual, connected to the individual. And there's very specific energy fields that are generated by these talismanic uh, sigil books who condense energies from particular st uh, streams of energy these uh, that are out there through the use of sigils which condense these energies when these energies are condensed and they are then viewed they are released into your consciousness and they have to be in a very specific order they have to be in the book the way they are and this very sealed magical tool that um, guild books are to work properly and completely, and if they, and if you you can't use other people's, and uh, it's a very bad idea to be using other people's energy because while there's a transfer in one direction towards the energy flowing into you, there's also a transfer from you into there because you're becoming one with that material. Now our material is done in a very direct fashion that way. But this is happening anyway with any material you use. So you're binding with the material, the material is binding with you, and this whole occult process is going on. And um, while these things then tend not to, um, particularly with common books, give you great empowerments, uh, which is what they should do. Our books are geared to initiating you and moving you up. That's the whole idea of happening it. But you're taking on the negativity of that person. So your consciousness is going to be based on a book like that from a guy who's a Satanist. You're going to be connected to the dark or satanic realm of runic studies because that's what that person's about. It's very interesting that um, be, ever since they have done this and presented their books, there's been a whole stream of really satanic negativism and fascism, Nazism connected to the runes in general uh, because these people were out there pushing it and their energies were causing that. The most successful book written on runes, of course, is the Book of Runes by Ralph Blum, who, interestingly enough, is a Jew. <laughs> and obviously was smart enough, magical enough, which his book is still a classic and selling to this day 30 years later in the top amount of books, and made himself a fortune, and good for him which all these big tough Satanists couldn't do. They couldn't even get their books published until recently when they're using their alleged criminal background uh, to force kind of other publishers to publish their dribble. That is getting out 20 years after it was written. Even though they had all these connections with everybody else. Isn't that interesting? So there's a real disconnect that someone who claims to have power there and wants just uh, uh, having information. They basically achieve nothing.
And, you know, that's the other aspect of all this is that what is it? It's just like Aleister Crowley. You know, if you look at the information and who that person is, is that he's totally complete failure. He's basically never achieved anything magically. Not a single thing has he ever manifested. Well, you want to connect into that energy realm, don't you? And like most Crowleyites, they're losers just like the person they follow. And what a bunch of dribble that he put out, just in general. And certainly proven to be ineffective. Doesn't work. Which in occultism is the ultimate sin, because the bottom line is if, if you can write all the dribble you want, but is it effective or not? So, and, and this again gets back to the credibility of who you get involved with. You have to worry about whether, whether they know what they're talking about. But the other problem, as I said here, is this whole occult disease. And you've got to be very careful who you deal with, particularly with the Internet and everything else, because now information flows very easily from you or I should say, into you. Transferred strictly by these images that are in computers and uh, so forth. So, um, it's a serious problem, and a lot of people have compounded. So if you have a problem, and then you start reading books about Satanism and demons and all this other stuff, and then you start connecting to, or you go to sites where they give you rituals that you do, and you know, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't have to cost you a penny. But the minute you start doing these things, you connect to these things and you open those doors. And if you're having a problem, uh, you're going to bring in more problems to you. And of course, in the, in the world of occultism, even, in, even to this day and age, um, nobody really gives you any kind of guidance or mentoring uh, except the guild. We're the only ones you can get in emails. You're the only way you can talk to people in that organization that aren't just some clerk Oh, everybody else is too busy. They're too busy taking a bunch of people's money and giving them nothing and connecting them up to negative stuff so they can make more money. You know, organizations that don't respond to you, that don't take time out to work with the people they are selling products to, are people you shouldn't be dealing with, period. And they are negative people with negative things behind them. And if nothing else, it's they're nothing but frauds. And this is very common. Nobody wants to spend any time with anybody because they will be discovered as the fraud that they are because when they are finally are asked questions, they won't be able to answer them. But they're too busy screwing somebody else over and getting their money. They're not there to teach and assist you. They're there strictly to make money. And there's nothing wrong with making a certain amount of money. Everyone has to do it. Everything costs in life. But then it becomes an abusive. And what are you getting for it? If you're selling somebody a product, then there ought to be proper service. Something that seems to be a real problem in this day and age with computer companies and everything else that don't want to talk to people, that don't have phone numbers, and, and want, don't want to give you customer service, including the most biggest organizations in the world who are the most wealthy, who have literally hundreds of billions of dollars. But they won't spend a billion or two of that to make sure that you get customer service. Google, Facebook, good luck getting anything from those people. They got one direction. That means they take your money and put it in their pocket. And they don't give a damn. You have a problem, get lost. And people accept this. Now, you may it's okay with those crap services just talked about because technically, kind of, I don't know if they're really free or not. They're, they're doing all sorts of things to track you and make money off of you. So the whole idea is you're getting a service, but you're, you know, in a lot of ways you're paying a very big price for that potentially on all sorts of levels. But anyone that won't assist and work with you and doesn't have an open email uh, with a person of high qualifications there is someone you don't want to deal with. And also shows how contagious they are. These people are toxic that don't do that. They're using and abusing you, and they're connected to all sorts of negativity. And guess what? You just got that flowed into you. And it's not a joke. And I like to, as I said, equate it with 
crude sexuality. And the fact is, is that if you're going to go around having random, unprotected sex with people, you are going to die. You're going to get AIDS. We're still kind of ignored in the media right now, but still the number one killer around the world. Not to mention every other nice little charming uh, STD out there as well. Because it's always, you know, it's always nice not to get AIDS, but, you know, gonorrhea and syphilis, that's fine. But if you took the precautions, and even if you're a person who is, quote, promiscuous, and that you take cautions, and you wear um, condoms and so forth, you're going to make, you're not going to have those problems. But if you just go out there and have unprotected sex everywhere, you will get into problems, it's guaranteed. And there's no difference between randomly getting occult information off the web, free or not, taking it into your consciousness, and then allowing those toxicities, those illnesses, that contagious energy that you've just infected yourself with is going to cause you serious problems, plain and simple. It will toxify your occult power centers. It will close them down. Your inner magical being will be closed down. You will lose power. You will become, you will become magically impotent. And not only on your, that level, but they've also infected your regular mind level, which is infected bad enough, the goofball, uh, terrible mind uh, reality that everyone deals with. But it's fed you with a bunch of information that you were giving credibility to after all you read it. And you may reject some of it, but it gets into your consciousness and you're believing these people and what they have to say. Which means the next time you go somewhere else and you get uh, information of any value whatsoever, you're going to judge it by what this other person said. So you can see the entire cumulative snowball effect here, the infecting of you mucusy pus of vomiting rot of scum that gets into your inner magical being and your occult aura systems and you look like some sort of uh, uh, victim from a horrible sci-fi movie uh, from exposed to horrible chemicals of radiation. This is what your aura looks like when you continue to do these kind of practices, take this information is, and as those occult diseases you pick up wherever you go, you picked up a little here, you picked it up from this author, you believe that. I mean, all these things go on and on. You know, authors that perpetrate, you know, uh, psionic warfare and these little people like that. I mean, what is that kind of nonsense? Psionic terrorism? Well, if you go to an author like that, you're going to pick up all their garbage. So you have to be very, very careful of what's involved with it. And, the, and the, these people are just that. They are corrupt, terrible people. Uh, and have all sorts of these psychological and occult problems, and they're more than happy to pass those on to you. And the whole occult infection starts, and where does it end? It ends in a highly crossed person, where you start your life starts to fall apart, you start to get ill, and you self-destruct, and, and that includes all areas of your life. And it usually leads to some sort of very strong curse effect on you, because if someone then does curse you, which is quite common, because you're all toxic and negative, these curses stick in you and bed in themselves like a horrible tick grinding its way to suck the blood out of you. So you have to be very careful. Know who you are contacting. Know what information you are getting from, of where that person is connected to. I mean, most people, in one reason or another, because they think you're so stupid or don't care, list, like was in this book, actually thanking the head of the Temple of Sat for all the help he got. It's just, it's just unbelievable. And, of course, now you can just punch a name in the computer and find out where that name is connected to. Back then, you had to do further research. You had to find out. It's very difficult. And this isn't all that long ago. You're only talking about 20 years ago, which is a drop in the bucket. 
it was very difficult to find any. Where did you find it? You had to read an awful lot of magazines. You had to do a lot of hunting up. You had to send for a lot of catalogs and information. Uh, and it was a very arduous process that very few people did. Now that's not the case. Basically, it takes a few seconds to get some basic information on someone, um, at least to a certain level. But it is important. It's also important if you're going to get quality training, does that person have a background uh, that is uh, that states that? You know, are they... Have they been trained from a mystery school or a guild? Are they a nonprofit organization? All these things are important. They've read a lot of books, and that's it. And whose books have they read? Is there anything unusual? Also, the classics, the educated Wikipedia people, they've got all their education from Wikipedia. I mean, really, what have they read? What, what are they really putting? And you can go through bibliographies and see, well, how special are these books? And in general, you find there's nothing special about these books. They're all the same crap, and they've read all the same 50 books that everybody else has had. Now they've written their own piece of crap book, and this is going to be the information you go by. So you're going to pick up all that. Not only are you going to get that direct information junk transfer into your consciousness. You're going to get all the occult illnesses that go with that. So take some steps. Watch if you're not getting or you're getting information from other sources other than the guild or using even used books or everything else. Be careful. You're hooking yourself up with all sorts of crap which will depower you which will infect you and will make you magically impotent. You do the proper cleansings, know who you deal with, and then there are no problems. As simple as that. So, there is no cult reality until the occult scientist creates it. Question everything. Believe nothing. And let the guild be your guide.